<laughs> Welcome to episode six of season two of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures Collegiate Baseball League, presented by Change Up. I'm Matt Satilli. I am joined, as always, by my co-host Owen Shadrick. Owen, great to see you as always. How you doing today? Doing well, Matt. Big week in baseball with a couple of trades going down, so the market's heating up, and you know we're heating up as we get ready for the summer, of course. But yeah, excited to be back here. Absolutely. We inch one week closer to the season every time we step out and release one of these episodes. And we have a pretty good one today. It's with Nate Tellier. You want to talk about the big leagues. He got drafted by the Boston Red Sox, signed a contract with them in September. He talks all about that. Just a great overall interview. Yeah, it was great to hear from Nate, you know, get another player perspective on the podcast. Excited for you guys to hear this one. Yeah, he's got a lot of great things to say, and we're really excited to take you guys into this episode. It's our second player interview of season two and our second pitcher after Nick Domkowski. So without further ado, here's our episode with Nate Tellier. At this time, we now welcome on a very special guest. This summer, he pitched as a reliever for the Brockton Rocks, and on September 1st, he signed a professional contract with the Boston Red Sox. It is Nate Tellier. Nate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. How are you? Not too bad. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're doing well. Uh, so let's get right into it. So you played for the Rocks this summer in the Futures League. What did it mean for you to get a chance to play baseball this summer? Uh, it, meant, it meant everything. Um, it got canceled back in March. That was, that was crushing. It was my senior year. So when we got the year back and I uh, heard summer ball was being able to be played, um, I just – I was excited. I just wanted to get back on the field. Um, it's a great experience. Yeah, it was certainly a great summer for all of those involved. And there's a first on the podcast. You know, we're two seasons in here, a couple of episodes deep into season two. You're our first full-time reliever we've had on the podcast. So Really? Huh? But, yeah. So have you always wanted to come out of the bullpen, or did you start originally and then move there? Honestly, uh, I didn't like pitching, to be in college. I hated it. Um, I was a two-way at UMass Dartmouth, um, but that's just where – baseball led me I was better at pitching um and it worked out for the better so yeah we took a deep dive and looked into some of your stats you were certainly great at the plate and on the mound so we'll get into that a little later but you know your craft like you mentioned you're better at pitching you're coming out of the bullpen I'm I'm always curious what's your mindset when you're coming in either during a tight game where you have a clean inning or maybe you're called in top of the eight, one out. You got a couple runners on, messy situation. How do you try to prepare yourself for something like that? Um, I, I don't. Uh, I love coming in with uh, tight situations, like man on uh, man on second, bases loaded, maybe. Um, I don't really got to do much preparation to get me in the mindset. Once I'm on the mound and see those runners on those tight situations, it's just it's just locked in for me. So Nate, you've been in the league multiple years, and one thing that we've asked a lot of guests is about how the futures league has helped the kids return to school. So how do you feel like the futures league helped you when you returned to UMass Dartmouth for the fall? Um, so it's just, you see a lot of kids with excess talent, um, really good talent. And that's something you don't always see in D3, like D3, that's great talent, but in uh, the futures league, and it needs to be all that. Um, you really see the talent notched up a little bit, the best of D1, D2, D3 all in one area. So um, it really prepares me going back to school. Now, what advice did you try to take from your Brockton teammates or perhaps when you were with Martha's Vineyard in 2018, when you were a little bit younger, you know, what is that give and take in terms of information with other guys on your pitching staff? Um, so it's just, if you're trying to work on something, there's a lot of knowledge there. So this, this summer I tried to work on a changeup. So I went around asking everybody about, uh, their grips on a change, but I was just fooling around with it. Um, and yes, there's just so much knowledge there that anything you need to work on, there's someone else that already has been working on it. So someone already went through it. So just ask away and you'll get your answers. Yeah. And you certainly had a good coaching presence with Andy Terrio and Matt Gedman. But before we get into some of that stuff, how do you think the league as a whole has grown since 2018 when you were first with Martha's Vineyard? Uh, the talent's going great. Um, it could be because uh, just every – Futures League was the only one open this year. Um, so everyone wanted to play in it. We had kids from the Cape, kids from the NECBL, kids from just Futures year past. But um, it's definitely – the talent's definitely grown. 
exponentially. Um, talent was great in 2018. Talent's great in 2020. From talented players to talented coaches, Matt just touched on it. Andy Terrio and Matt Gedman were two of your coaches this summer in Brockton. What did you learn from those guys? Andy was just – Gedman's more of the um, hitting coach and all that. Um, but Andy's Andy's a great pitching coach. He um, he really tells you to listen to your body. Um, if, if there's a day that you're just not feeling it, he's very um, understanding about that. It's not like he'll push you – uh, to the point where you get hurt or nothing. Um, so yeah, he's, he's, he's real good with that. Um, and whenever I was in a tough, tough spell and um, out on the field, he'd come out and most of the time I just wouldn't be getting out front on top of the ball. So he'd tell me that. And after that, it was good. So um, he notices, he notices little niches in you um, and he just focusing on that to make you a better player. Yeah, speaking of instructing pitchers and pitchers on your team, you played against many guys that were on your team in the Futures League in college as well. You played against Jack Fox at Emerson this season. He went six innings against you guys. What's it like playing against those guys in college and then coming and, you know, being chummy with them and being teammates with them in the Futures League? It's great. Um, uh, so there's a couple kids from uh, Wheaton on the team, like Pat Arter, Jake Studley, um, Gavin Riley, all that So. Uh, we have a nice rivalry with Wheaton, UMass Dartmouth and Wheaton. So it's nice to get to see them. And they're always like, oh, yeah, we, we should have won that. Or like, oh, we beat you and all that. Um, so it's always – it's fun to see um, kids from the other team playing with them because you get to see their side of baseball and what they thought of the game and all that. Um, so, yeah, it's real fun. And you're donning the hat right now. You had a great – fall in terms of advancing your skills to the next level. But, you know, how important do you think it was this summer for you to get visibility from scouts when you were playing with the rocks? It was, it was extremely important. Um, so what made me, what made me go do that is that I read a scouting report on me and it said like, Oh, he's only 90 to 92 and all that. And I was, Oh, I don't, I don't like that too much. Um, so I went in and I tried to get as much exposure as possible. And, um, there's a lot more exposure than I thought there was going to be. I thought there wasn't going to be any like fans or like, or scouts in the um, stands or nothing, but um, yeah, there's, there's scouts on mostly every game. Um, so a lot of exposure really helped me. Um, I don't think if I didn't play this summer, I don't think I would have got signed in the fall. So you just mentioned you read your own scouting report. Are you big on bulletin board material? Are you kind of sifting to see what maybe the scouts are seeing about you or do you try to, just kind of lock in and do what you have to do and do what you can control. I usually try to lock in, um, but it was just, it was just a uh, abnormal year. Um, it was my senior year in college. Um, I didn't know what they, uh, what they really had in store for me. Um, and we lost our, we lost our senior year. So I wanted to get as much exposure as possible. I was going to, if the scouting report is what I thought of myself, then I'd be like, all right, that's fine. Like, that's true. But um, I didn't really, I didn't really uh, like what they had to say. So I had to go out there and expose myself a little more. Yeah. And that paid off and we'd be stupid not to talk about this. You're a kid from mass. You play college ball in mass and you got signed by the Boston Red Sox, your hometown team. Take us through that experience. Uh, it's just unreal. Um, I was talking, I was talking to Matt Hyde, a Yankee scout for a while. And then he invited me to a scouting game and uh, I did pretty well. Um, so that night, uh, Ray Fagnan contacted me and um, just said, do you have time to talk? I'm like, yeah, sure. So over the next couple of days, he gave me medical info and whatever, and then he wants to talk to me. Um, 1130 at night, he texts me. He's like, oh, can we meet tomorrow? I'm like, sure. So he comes by around noonish and just – I thought I was just going to talk just regularly, just talk about baseball. Um, but it's half an hour into our talk. He's like, oh, yeah, do you want to be a Red Sox? I got a name with your contract on I got a contract with the name on it right here. I'm like, ah, I tried to play it cool. And I was like, oh, let me talk to my parents. But, you know, right then I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to sign. <laughs> that was great. Sure. I'm sure there were harder decisions for you to make throughout your baseball career. So congrats on that once again. Now, Ray Fagnan appeared on this podcast. He had a lot of really great advice to say about players trying to get drafted. And we actually asked him, is there a player under the radar that you're keeping your eyes on? He mentioned you. So – perhaps a little sneak preview of that contract that got signed, but his son played for new Britain. He was super active around the futures league. How did that relationship grow this summer? And how did the futures league facilitate that connection? 
Um, I don't know much. I I, I met his uh, son like once. Um, but uh, and I don't think uh, I didn't hear of Ray until five days before I signed. Um, he but apparently he was around a future league a lot, just watching. Um, I played his son maybe two or three games throughout the year, and um, he was just there. He uh, he said he saw me pitch about two innings, um, in the league. Again, just more exposure for scouts. Um, he was just there, so um, yeah. Yeah, well, either way, it worked out to your advantage. Now, I got to ask, you're wearing the shiny new lid. Did you have to buy that with your own money, or was that on the house? So this this one was my own money when I first signed, but the ones on the house um, they sent, it was, it's, it's a little different. It's like a striped kind of right there with stitches. But, um, yeah, no, I, this one, this one's the OG one. This one I've had. Wow, the pl- the exclusive player collection. I remember there was a new era hat commercial back in the day about you can get this hat one of two ways. You can sign a contract or you can go to Lids and buy one. But, you know, you got both. So credit to you. That, that's pretty neat. I appreciate it. Yeah, and kind of going, you talked about your skills and your scouting reports. So we're going to dive into that a little bit. Your fastball is clocked out at 98 miles an hour. That's absolutely nuts. How did you develop that? Um. Just a lot of legs and a lot of long toss. Um, my sophomore year in college, when I really got serious about pitching, I uh, just really crushed de- uh, deadlifts, squats. Um, I'd throw a long toss two to three times a week. Um, it's just really about taking care of your arm, making sure it can withstand the high velocity and just getting your uh, lower half into it. It's um, 75% lower half, 25% arm. So, um yeah, a lot of explosiveness, all that. Still, still focus on all that today. Just getting stronger with what I do. So I just want to make sure the message there is for kids is to not skip leg day. Never, never skip leg day. You don't want to be the one with scrawny legs. I love it. Wow, seventy five percent lower half. Interesting. Would never have thought that, but definitely. I mean, you're you're you tell the tale right here. So duly noted. So you also, we read something that said that you've added a breaking ball to your pitching arsenal. How has that developed? And when you're getting a new pitch in general, like how much time do you have to spend really trying to perfect that and making sure that you trust it as much as your other pitches? So my breaking ball I've had for a while. It's my changeup that I was trying to perfect this summer. Um, and that took me like two, two and a half years because um, I just kept switching around with grips because some days some grips would work, other days other grips would work. And it's really just all about getting one grip that works all the time. Yeah, so this summer I just throw long toss with it, just get the feel down. Um, what Like how hard do I got to throw for it to go this far? Uh, what do I got to do to make it move? But, um, yeah, when you're when you're trying for a new pitch, you just change around grips and uh, just whatever works, and you just throw it as much as possible. Yeah, not only are you talented on the mound, but you're talented at the dish. You touched on it earlier. You know, you wanted you wanted to be a hitter. So when you are doing both at UMass Dartmouth, how do you balance both being a hitter and a pitcher during, you know, your college season? Um, you got to put in a lot more work on your, on your own time. Um, how it would work, it would be it usually be like two hour practice. Um, I'd go with the pitchers for most of the time. I'd throw my pen, I'd go like that. And then I get a couple swings at the end of practice, a couple of bats. Um, and then I would just have to stay after for an hour or two and just, get my swings in, get my cardio in. Um, and then we'd have pitches afterward have lifting and conditioning and all that. So it's definitely a lot of work, but it's worth it because you're always involved with the game. Um, the only bad thing about being a reliever is that you're not involved with the game all the time and you have a certain amount of throws you can have with your arm. So being a two way, you're always involved in the game, always in the action, never bored. Yeah, and this summer in the Futures League, we we looked at your hidden stats. You you had one plate appearance, but did you beg for any more plate appearances than that? Yes, yes, yes. I, I begged for a good amount. Um, my uh, so my first summer in the Futures with the Sharks, it's uh, I was I was set on being a two way, whatever. And um, this is like one of the best things a coach has done for me, Jay Mendez. Um, he was he gave me tough love. I I, I called him up. I said, I, Coach, I I don't know if I. I want to be here. I don't want to just be a pitcher. I want to go somewhere else. I can be a two way. And um, he's like, yeah, okay. If you stay, we'll give you some at bats. I got like six at bats all year. Um, So 
Uh, but afterwards, he's like, man, you're a pitcher. That's where your calling is. I know it might suck, but you just need to be a pitcher. Um, but, yeah, so that was – if he never did that, if I didn't start focusing on pitching right then, I don't think I could be where I am today. But this summer, I definitely, definitely asked Andy a couple of times. Me, uh, Nick Sinicola, Polly Crew, um, we all we all asked him. You know, and I got walked my one at bat, which I was very mad about. <laughs> I didn't want to walk. Swing for the fences. Yeah, well, I guess that says that, you know, you know a little bit something about pitching and you were laying off. You knew what he was throwing. So a little spin zone for you there. Now, were there ever any games at college because you are a reliever where you would be in the dugout and you'd be hitting for the first, you know, two, three plate appearances and then get called in from the bullpen? Because if that was the case, that's crazy. Yeah, so I um, I was a center fielder all four years at UMass Dartmouth and – um, I was a closer, so it would, it would stink. Some games I would be pitching the ninth. They'd, uh, they'd call me in, um, and then I would I didn't have a chance to warm up yet, and I was hitting at the top of the ninth. So I start off the inning at the top of the ninth. I would whatever either get on, get out, and then I have an hour or two to warm up. So I'd have to really do that quick. Um, so that was the only bad part about it. And throughout the wear and te- and throughout the game, there's a bunch of wear and tear in your arm. So by the time you come in, you're a little tired, but uh. Yeah, so it's definitely definitely crazy and a lot of work to be, be the two-way, but it was worth it. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine if you're clocking out in the 90s and you're gunning someone out at home from center field during the game, yeah, it would take a little wear and tear on your arm if you're coming in the ninth, right? Yeah, for sure. And so what is your adjustment when you go to warm up and you only have one or two outs versus having the time to go through your whole motion and routine? Um. You just got to kind of lock in once you get in there. Um, sometimes they'd bring out a catcher to center field, and I just start throwing um, throwing a bullpen in between innings instead of warming up. Um, and I come in, I do bands real quick, go up to hit. And then um, some days I wouldn't even get to throw in the pen. I would just, I'd be on, I'd be stranded on second or something. And then they'd bring out my glove and I'd just go pitch. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just you really got to lock in um, and just, it's a, it's a, it's an adjustment. I'm sure. And Hey, they say the best of bail, the best ability is availability. So I guess, I guess you were a, like a five tool player at the plate and on the mound. So that's crazy. Credit to you for that. Appreciate it. Before we return to our interview with Nate Tellier, once again, we wanted to give a big shout out and thanks to change up one of the FCBL's cornerstone sponsors. Change up is a cutting edge player centric pitch and performance management application by comprehensively and accurately tracking pitch activity and capturing critical in-game performance data, ChangeUp helps baseball coaches protect their pitchers from overuse and helps players reach their full potential safely. During the 2020 season, FCBL teams reap the benefits of the ChangeUp application, including the ability to keep college coaches informed on what and how their players are doing here in the FCBL. Coaches and parents at all levels, Little League, AAU, high school, and the collegiate level take notice. Changeup is a clear choice to ensure your pitchers aren't being thrown too much or too often and are getting proper rest. In addition, Changeup's analytics function helps coaches and players understand each pitcher's current performance thresholds and helps inform training protocols to get your players to the next level. The Futures League is bringing you tomorrow's baseball superstars today. Changeup is helping make sure those superstars travel safely and as far as possible on their personal baseball journeys. Are you ready to join the ChangeUp revolution? For more information, visit ChangeUp's website, www.changeup.io. That's www.change-up.io. ChangeUp. Every pitch counts. We now return to our interview with Nate Tellier. You were ranked fourth nationally by perfect game for D3 players. How much pride do you have in being a New England D3 talent? Um like a lot of uh so d3 the best d3 baseball around is in new england uh in my in my point of view so um being amongst them is um is it's 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 great so because there's so much talent um in here so being with the top names there it's really uh an honor yeah you speak about talent you guys at umass dartmouth were quite talented in the spring you guys started nine and one which is your best start in the last 25 years where did you feel like you guys were at when the season ended that was uh that was our year. Like we were we were all um we could disappointed because that was the year we were gonna go all the way because we had the talent, 
We had a, a whole starting lineup except one or two were just seniors. We were all experienced. Um, so when when we got the news that it was canceled, it was it, it was just crushing. But um, uh, the most of the most of the guys are coming back this year, so hopefully they'll have a good chance. Um, a little disappointed I won't be there to to win with them, but you know, on to bigger things. Now, do you have any plans to return back to school? I'm curious if anyone that was scheduled to graduate is being granted an extra year of eligibility or if you're just moving on and preparing to get ready for utilizing your professional contract right now. Yeah, so um, I was planning on coming back to school only for baseball. Um, I I do want to further my education later on, being a PA after baseball is on done, but um, – I was going to come back strictly just to play baseball. So I would be getting a master's in um, some business, but I'm a bio major, so it would be a pointless master's. Um, but mostly I think every senior, but two are coming back this year and they're all getting their master's. Um, so it's a good, it's a good year to further your education. Yeah, absolutely. And question about your education. So you just said it, you're a bio major. What made you want to be a bio major and what were some of your classes like at UMass Dartmouth? So I originally wanted to be a physical therapist, um, except that's three years additional school after um, college and P- being a PA is only two. So I just always loved uh, anatomy and just learning about the body. Um, I feel like the best way to stay healthy is just know what's going on in your body. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a tough major, but it was definitely cool. Uh, to get to know all about the body between your immune system, your anatomy, your uh, microbiology, all that good good stuff. So you talk about that, you know, learning about the body. Does that help you as a pitcher? Um, I wouldn't say as a pitcher. I would just say more as an athlete. Uh, You get to know what's going on, um, how important sleep is, how important eating right is, and how bad going out on a Saturday night would be, um, all that. So – you really get to know what what's uh, what's going on with the body and how to how to treat it right. Yeah, sleep in college is a is a whole different study on its own. <laughs> it doesn't happen. <laughs> no, it doesn't exist. And before we get to our final segment, how about a message to Rocks and Futures League fans as we enter into twenty twenty one? A message, huh? Um, I uh, I just want to say good luck to the Rocks because they're a great organization. Um, I know Andy's was stepping down as a uh, head coach. Uh, he'll be missed, but um, good luck to the rocks and uh, good luck to the futures league. And uh, we definitely are excited to see what the rocks do in 2021. And we have one final segment for you here. It's called quick hits. It's presented by Zephyr, the official on field hat of the futures league. Zephyr high quality and innovative design since 1993. So we know you're swapping out your Zephyr rocks hat for your new era socks hat, but they've been our presenting sponsor of this final segment. So Nate, we got a couple more questions to ask you for our audience to help to get to know you a little bit better. Is that cool with you? Yeah, for sure. All right, let's do it. Favorite teammate that you've played with in the FCBL. FCBL. Um, Nick Raposo on 2018 uh, Vineyard Sharks. Okay. What about him? Um, he's just, we work out together all the time. He pushes me, he got, he signed to the Cardinals. Um, so we're in the same place right now. He, uh, yeah, we just push each other. We just make fun of each other all the time. Um, really just uh good sports to each other. It's awesome. Yeah. Always need someone like that. How about yeah, a favorite sure. ballpark that you've ever played in? Um, in the futures. It could be in the or futures. In and then if you also want to offer one, maybe just in college or that you've ever played in. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the rocks. I was, I was actually, yeah, no, uh, Bristol blues when they were in the futures, that was, that was, that was, that was a cool park to go to. Um, Nashua, um, Roy Campanella played there, I believe. Um, but I'm, I'm always a fan of, uh, the rocks. I thought it was cool. Cause I grew up, I, I went to a bunch of the games when they were independent league and all that when I was younger. So, uh, it was cool to, cool to grow up and play there. Yeah, definitely important to have a comfort level for the stadium you're pitching in. So it certainly played to your advantage this summer. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how about when you're walking out to the mound, what's your pitching entrance music? Oh, it's Black Betty by Ram Jam. 
Let's go. Yeah, yeah. I really like the hard rock going out there. I don't usually – I don't listen to hard rock anywhere else. It's just um, – that just gets me in the zone. It's been my walk up for a couple of years now, so I don't plan on changing it. Sure. You're looking for something generally to kind of hype you up a little bit, but nothing too mm-hmm. crazy so you can settle down? Because that's a, that's a song that got some good balance there for those two. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Love it. All right. Now, the question we typically ask here is favorite big league team and player, but I feel like we know the answer to big league teams. So <laughs> how about a favorite player, whether current or historical? Historical, well, kind of current. Um, Dustin Bajoya. He hasn't, he hasn't played for a while, but he was always – a motivation to me because I was always tiny. I was never, I was, there was never that point in um, growing up where I was taller than everyone else. I was just gradually, gradually tiny. So um, I always looked at him like he was a motivation because he'd wake up, he'd go to the ballpark. He was always the first one there and last one to leave. Um, so I really uh, put my, based my training off of him, just really working hard and want to be the hardest working person out there. Okay. Now, how about a pitcher, someone that you either look up to or try to model your game after? So, uh, Jonathan Papelbon was one of my favorite pitchers growing up because he's just a hard-throwing um, closer. Um, but I did meet Pedro Martinez, and he is such a nice guy. So, um, I would say he personally, Pedro Martinez is my favorite pitcher. But I would say athletically, I would say Jonathan Papelbon just because the way he plays, this his Irish jig when they won the World Series. That I was um, – stuck with me but yeah i love it will we ever see you bust out the irish jig if you guys have a <laughs> pennant in the majors no no i don't, I don't think so i'm gonna I, I feel like duplicating that would just be it wouldn't be right fair enough fair enough how about a favorite stadium or in general a sports venue that you've ever visited as a fan i visited the national park um the national park which was just pretty cool no um, but fenway was always fenway was always my favorite only, only because I, I've only been to two parks. I haven't really traveled much. So Fenway was – Fenway, the Nationals Park, but Fenway is always my favorite. It's always just a historical park. Um, hey, well, I guess that's a good thing that if you've only visited two and you liked them both, that, you know, pretty good track <laughs> record there. <laughs> exactly. All right, so now I got to ask, how about a sports stadium or an event that's on your bucket list that you haven't been to yet that you want to go to? All of them. All of them. Um, uh, Wrigley Field. Um yeah, I just, I just want to I want to visit all of them. I want to go on a road trip. If I, if I if I never make it to um the majors, which hopefully I do. Um I want to go on a road trip and just visit all the um pro parks cuz that's just I don't know. I I just I love all the fields, see them on TV all the time and it'd be great to actually go there. Yeah, you are certainly not alone in that journey. That's that's something that, you know, I as a baseball fan and many baseball fans are also interested in doing. So that's a, that's a great answer. And then how about a baseball nickname or a nickname that you've gotten because of baseball over the last couple of years? Uh, my friends just call me tell my last name is tell you. They just call me tell. Um, yeah. No other nickname than that. Are you superstitious at all? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very. Um, I always got to eat peanut butter for a baseball game. Um, I always got to wipe off the mound between each pitch with my feet. Anytime someone says anything that could be considered a jinx, got to knock three times on wood. Um, yeah, just uh, those are my three main superstitions. Yeah, They're, and if I don't knock three times, it's it's bad. It's gonna come true. Um, so I got a lot of things to keep my mind straight. Yeah, that that jinx one certainly hurt, hits home for sure. <laughs> And then how about when you're visiting the ballpark, favorite ballpark food? Oh, favorite ballpark food. Um, fried dough. Fried dough. I'd always get that at the end of the game. Um, I'm not a big hot dog fan. I'd go there. I'll have a hot dog if I'm at a pro baseball, just just because it's tradition. But um, definitely look forward to the fried dough at the end of the game. Is that with cinnamon sugar or marinara? Oh, no, that's with powdered sugar. Powdered uh a bunch of powdered sugar to the point where you take a bite and just explodes everywhere. See, I think you're discounting what marinara and a little Parmesan sauce could do on there. A little Italian style. Maybe that's just me, but I'll take it both I've, ways. I've never tried it. I guess I'm going to have to try it. Let us marinara. know. If you do, Cause it's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> All right. All right. Anyway. And then <laughs> how about bubble gum or sunflower seeds? Sunflower seeds. 
Any brand or flavor in particular? Um, I like the Biggs Dill Pickle. Yeah. That was my favorite. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's a fantastic answer. Uh, as many of you know, my favorite flavor. So big shout out that Dill Pickle gets another point on the board. <laughs> All right. Then finally, how about a favorite all-time baseball memory? I would say um, I, in 2018 um, for the Sharks after – after we had that, the Thai championship or whatever, the the co co champs, um, we all chilled at the um, ballpark for an hour or two and just drove golf carts around. We had those big bubble things. We'd run a, um, those orb things. We'd run into each other. It was just um, it was a great way to end the season, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, just being with the boys one last time before leaving. Yeah, those are memories that you'll never forget. And, you know, even in spite of a tie, our first tie in championship history, you guys made the most out of it. So great answer. Well, Nate, this has been awesome today. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on signing with the Red Sox. And we're so excited to see what you do. Of course. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. So this has been episode six of season two of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures Collegiate Baseball League. We got new episodes coming out every Monday. Make sure to subscribe. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. See everyone soon.